The problem with delivering a review for Bloodborne is that, while it is a great game that does many things right, I also have quite a few problems with it. I don't want to have the wrong summary come across by the time I am done, so let me be clear about this now. Bloodborne is really good. I recommend that everyone play it, even those that find the Souls games too difficult. There's going to be a lot of complaints by the time I am done, but this doesn't mean that I don't enjoy the game. After some consideration, I've decided I am going to partially stick with my new format, as seen in the Outlast review. The difference is that I'm going to go through all five categories twice. The first time I will express all that is good about the game, the second, what is bad. Little faith. <laughs> I want to get this out of the way first, not because it is to be cast aside, but because it is my favorite thing about the game. The music of Bloodborne is fucking amazing. Amazing. Easily, without question, the best soundtrack I have ever heard. It ranks with the top albums of all time, from all genres. It's that fucking good. I don't know if it is the fact that there are multiple composers, or if there is a limited number of tracks compared to the Souls titles, or both, but they did an outstanding job. I went in thinking the Cleric Beast track from the Alpha was amazing, and it is still my favorite, but that doesn't mean other tracks aren't also worthy of attention. I actually have a feeling that this is the difference that can be felt between orchestral computer software and a true orchestra. I remember playing the game on the second day, and I had gotten to Gascon, and he had kicked my ass twice. I then had almost won on my third try. I wasn't upset, however. I turned to my wife and said something along the lines of, Holy shit, this is what a boss track should be. It was incredible to fight such an intense battle with his soundtrack blaring behind. It was powerful and terrifying, well-written, and well-performed. It's not alone, either. I shouldn't gush, but I simply can't help myself. The Cleric Beast and Gascon tracks are not alone. The Blood Star Beast track? Oh my fucking god. At first I was disappointed when I heard the Cleric Beast track reused for Amelia, but it ended up being the only case of this excluding the dungeon fights, and it eventually made sense. They are the two transformed members of the church that you fight, and them sharing a track ultimately comes off as heartbreaking. Nearly every track in the game is gorgeous, with only a couple exceptions that deserve to be skipped over. The Celestial Emissary track, for example, is shallow and boring, but I won't even bother to complain about it later on because it's surrounded by God-sent music. I particularly loved how there are a few tracks that break up the bloody, rampaging atmosphere to instead change over to a haunting and worrisome one, like Murgle's Melody or Garman's Song. Then on top of the already astounding boss tracks, they created a few places with intense atmospheric tracks, like the Upper Cathedral Ward and Uhargal, if you get taken prisoner. It's the kind of musical atmosphere that has been lost since Demon Souls' Tower of Latria. When I hear that prisoner vendor sing, it sends chills down my spine, and the same can finally be said for a second from title. Ah, wonderful. Just wonderful. Moving on to the sound effects, I can't go on and on about them as I did for the soundtrack, but they are really great as well. A particular few things I loved are the mobs who drag their axes, as you can hear the axe grinding on the cobblestones as they slowly walk. This amplifies when they charge at you, the grinding more continuous and threatening. At first I thought the chatter from the mobs would get on my nerves, with them constantly bitching that I am an enemy and that they want me to go away. It ends up seeming quite natural, and often subtle as you walk your kill your way through. I also love the groaning and moaning from mobs when they are not yet aware of you. When they are, it gets even better. One of my favorite moments is in Old Yarnum, when you are nearing the chamber with the strung-up beast. There's a lot of strange murmuring and moaning until one of the hood mobs spots you. It screams as an alarm, and suddenly all is silent as the group below begins to rush toward you. Nothing st tops the sounds of the bosses, however. I give high praise to Frum for having bosses screech and cry in addition to growl and yell. Roaring and snarling are good, don't get me wrong, but the screeches make it sound as if human vocal cords have been twisted and deformed. In particular, there is Amelia, which is all three of terrifying, haunting, and sorrowful. 
I feel truly sorry when I fight her, as if she is in a grand amount of distress and pain. Let's just come out and say this, yes? Bloodborne is a beautiful game. It definitely is the best looking game I have played thus far. I expect it to be dethroned of this compliment in just a couple of weeks, but we shall see. What I can say about Bloodborne is that it has the following three things strongly done. Performance, detail, and design. The game performs extremely well, with only rare occasions of feeling as if something is off. For example, if an attack misses, or you roll in a direction that you did not mean. The animations lend themselves heavily to an environment of believability, more so than any Souls games before this, and probably more so than any other game. It is fluid, precise, and exact, the kind of thing I always loved about Souls, now amplified to near perfection. There's not a single section of the game that doesn't feel visually fleshed out and detailed. Those of you that have played either Dark Souls game will know what I mean. At a certain point in both titles, you come across areas that feel incomplete, with repetitive textures, blotchy colors, and simplistic design choices. This is not true for Bloodborne, with a sense of completion in terms of the appearance of the entire game. One more satisfying thing in Bloodborne is the way in which objects fall apart. Stacks of books individually tumble and flop about, and tall candelabras break into thirty-some pieces as they scatter to the ground. It's a minor thing, but it's a nice touch. Something that I've seen people complain about is the lack of fashion souls, or excuse me, blood fashion. I heartily have to disagree. In fact, in this game I am having the most difficulty in selecting what to wear because nearly every piece can look good. In the souls titles it came down to usually only a few pieces, and that was on highly leveled characters. When it came to competitive PvP, especially in Demons and the First Dark, it always felt like you were stuck with very few options. Not in Bloodborne, however. No matter what level you are at, you can outfit yourself in any combination of gear, and it is a challenge because, as I said, they almost all look good. You gotta love those fancy hats. The appearance of enemies and bosses is often top tier. While there are too many humanoids for my tastes, they at least don't come off as mere soldiers or simple violent dudes. They are beastly and gross, frightening and cool. I want to point out something else I really loved, and that is the searing scratches that Amelia and the blood-starved beast can administer, Amelia especially. When I first saw her smash the ground with her right arm and then pull it back, loosing a set of long, orange claw marks, I was heavily impressed. One last thing concerning the graphics, the most obvious thing, that of being covered in blood. Before the game was released, I figured this was a mechanic that would simply be found gimmicky, that I wouldn't even care. That is not the case. It's actually rather inspiring to kill your way through a zone and then take the time to notice just how covered in gore you have become. It's a great and honestly realistic way to showcase how much work you have been doing. It gives, it gives a sense of depressing weight to what your character is having to go through. It also looks badass. In all the Souls titles, there is a basic story that, depending on your personal involvement and willingness to seek the information out, can be more or less important. Frankly, as much as I love it, it has to be admitted that the story truly doesn't matter, and that's a good thing. The object is to kill monsters and get treasure. I've always operated by this agenda, in video games, and the Souls titles key right into that. However, there's something more in your face about the story in Bloodborne. While I'm not saying it is easily understood, or denying that it is still cryptic, it is almost impossible to ignore picking up on certain story elements. Between the moon phases changing, the references to the church and the cosmos, and the baby crying sound effects, you'll get an impression of the overall story in Bloodborne without even concerning yourself. And quite a story it is, too. Easily the darkest yet in a From title, and that's saying something. There are some heavily borrowed elements from the Lovecraftian world, but not so much that I would state that anything was stolen. It feels as if there is more of a demon influence of some kind than anything else, particularly with the references to the church, impregnation, and creating beasts. Anyway, this is a review, and the point is that the story is pretty darn good. As far as NPCs go, it's true that there are very few within the game. 
Well, there are a few more than most people realize, but those extras don't have much interaction. However, in my opinion, the NPCs of Bloodborne are some of the most fulfilling. I found myself caring about Alfred's and Eileen's storylines more than almost any character in a Souls game, save for, for perhaps Solaire, Yuria, and the Maiden in Black. No better combat exists. Well, that's sort of a bold statement, isn't it? Here's the thing. The combat of Bloodborne is fast yet controllable, exact yet intense. Concerning the games in this style, Bloodborne has unquestionably the best hit detection of the four. It also has the best dodging, with the excellent addition of dashing while locked on and rolling while not. It allows players to not be limited by being unable to enlist unlocked play. In the previous titles, you were almost always at an advantage if you could play unlocked, as it granted a freedom of movement not found in combat per the way it was designed. From must have realized this, or they were simply experimenting and stuck with their new idea, which is likely the case. Either way, the combat has definitely advanced a level over top the previous games. That's not to say it is as fulfilling, but that's for another section. Dun dun dun. Another great thing about the combat is something that I can finally be said of one of these games. In all three Souls titles, you had certain weapons that were clearly the best, and then others that were only worth using early on. Even when it comes to PvP, there is a top-tier selection of weapons that you either use, or put yourself out there with a handicap. Not in Bloodborne. Though, you, though the weapon selection is limited, the entire arsenal is useful. No matter what you pick, you can not only best the game with those weapons, but remain competitive in PvP. Finally! As far as trick weapons go, I don't have anything negative to say about them. I should include that most of the time it still just felt like the difference between one-handing a weapon and using two hands. I was hoping there would be more interesting examples, like the Kirk Hammer. A longsword that is also a hammer is fantastic. The majority of the weapons simply grow or change their basic shape. I don't really consider this a complaint, though, because, as I said, they are all still useful and worthwhile. I actually really like the guns. As someone who dislikes shooters, and who dislikes guns in real life, that feels very strange to say. I thought for sure they would be the big part of Bloodborne that I hated. I even started out refusing to use them. That's not to say that I didn't, but I was trying my hardest not to. When it came time to kill the blood-starved beast, I found out that he could be parried and made easy. This led me to using the guns more and more, and eventually I learned that they are a great addition. I was never great at parrying in the Souls titles, but now I can finally participate in this game mechanic. There's just something more exact about firing to interrupt an attack than to swing a shield to deflect one. It could also just be the programming, but the parrying in Souls never seemed to be efficient. My Blood Tinge build, that takes advantage of extra bullet runes, has become my favorite. Another big change to the combat is the regain mechanic, that of hitting enemies shortly after you have been damaged to restore some lost health. It's great. It not only promotes aggression, but can trick players into rushing into their death, hoping to get health back and instead being slaughtered. I honestly wish that the window for the regain was slightly longer. Too many times I have been struck and wanted to go on the attack, but known that I would likely end up even more damaged, or worse, I've been stuck on the ground unable to even try and recover that lost health. The old tactic of ducking out, healing, and then baiting an attack to open a window is still the better option 99 times out of 100. Having the healing item, Blood Vials, assigned to a dedicated button is actually ingenious. We've all been playing a previous title and swore we were on our flask, only to use some other consumable instead. Now the mistake of not healing can only be placed on the player, and it saves equipped consumable room for any player's preference, instead of forcing them to use a slot on a flask. Two other things I want to quickly touch on are first the fact that you can't kill the doll. I mean, you can, but not permanently. Even though you could revive her in Dark Souls 2, it was at the cost of both souls and time. The other games, including Bloodborne, have done it right, that you can't kill the thing that can level you up. Second, the ladders, and the stamina spent on them. Finally, fucking finally, they realized how dumb they have been in regards to ladders. In Demon Souls, you only had one speed. Dumb. In Dark Souls, you could slide down but not up. Dumb. 
In Dark Souls 2, you could climb up fast and slide down, but at the cost of stamina. Dumb. In Bloodborne, you can slide down or climb fast freely. Smart. Finally. Now, hopefully in the next game, they will not have ladders affect stamina regeneration at all. The last hurdle that unfortunately still exists in Bloodborne. Fifth game is a charm? The design of the world is fantastic, competing what with Dark Souls generated. There are branching paths that loop around to other parts of the world, as well as shortcuts within the level that give the feeling of relief upon discovering them. It's a really cool feeling to look up from the Cathedral Ward at where you fought the Cleric Beast, or to look down upon where you fight the shadows from earlier in the forest. I can't say that the interconnectivity is on par with Dark Souls. I just can't. There's a moment in Dark Souls when you've gone through the Undead Burg, perish, move down many steps behind Andre, traverse through a large forest, work your way through a precipice valley of the Drakes to find that you come back up at Firelink. That might never be matched. To reach that level of awe again might not even be possible, but Bloodborne at least makes a decent effort. It was inspiring to traverse through the upper cathedral ward, killing the celestial emissary, to then break the window and stop cold. Below was the location in which you fight Amelia. I then checked out the view from the Grand Cathedral, and sure enough, I could see the balconies that led to Ebriatus. It's a great moment, and Bloodborne deserves its due for trying far harder than a certain sequel ever did. The last thing I must say positively is something that I know a lot of people don't agree with. I've been involved in several online discussions about the difficulty of the game, and while the general consensus is that the game is not as hard as any Souls title, it is not that simple. To get this out of the way so that you will know where I am coming from, I have never died to the Cleric Beast, the Witches, the Shadows, Amygdala, the Emissary, Parl, the Wet Nurse, Mikolash, or the Moon Presence. I have only a few deaths to Gascon, the Bloodstarved Beast, Garmin, Logarius, and Rom. The two campaign world bosses that gave me trouble are Amelia and Ebriatus, but even Amelia is no longer difficult. She was the original benchmark of the difficulty for me, killing me 22 times while I insisted on her being the third boss. As it remains, it is only Ebriatus that is truly a challenge. Does this mean that the game is too easy? Well, let's consider the dungeons, shall we? They exist and are easy enough to access, with optional bosses above ground giving you chalices, and materials found in the world to get you started. That is where the hardest bosses lie. I won't even bother to start naming them, but there's no arguing just how much more difficult these dungeon bosses are in comparison to the regular game. Even the same bosses, when repeated in the dungeons, become significantly harder, with stronger attacks, more health, handicaps on the player, and smaller arenas. What From has done with this title is exactly the correct way to handle allowing a larger audience to participate, while still upholding the difficulty for those who want it. Nearly everyone even those who don't normally partake of Souls games, should be able to complete the main campaign. They can have that sense of accomplishment and yet find they are still being slaughtered in the dungeons. It is essentially a difficulty selection organically built into the game. This is something that was always wanted by all the fans. For the game to be both harder and easier, we all fall somewhere on that two-option spectrum. If you want to just tackle the eight bosses required to complete the game, you can, and yes, it is only eight. Nine optional bosses await you just in the main game, some easier and some harder. But then the dungeons ex exist for those who truly want to challenge. Square off against the Defiled Watchdog, Abhorrent Beast, or Headless Bloodletting Beast, and then claim that the game is too easy. I give high praise to From for this adventure, because creating organic difficulty is something that really no game has been successful with yet. Most games have their difficulty options and, while it works, it also smacks you in the face with the fact that you're playing a game. Even the Souls games have had their loss of health upon death, but this always felt as more of an insult to in injury penalty as opposed to increasing the difficulty. Bloodborne is the game that finally got it right, with numerous optional bosses that all make the main game seem like a pushover. I'm going to save the longevity section until the end, as it deals with both PvP and farming. Let's go ahead and move on to what I disliked about Bloodborne. Hold on to your asses, because I don't plan on being gentle. Little Faith. <laughs> Alright, I lied. 
I will be gentle in this first negative section. The only complaint I have in regard to the music and sound, and I mean only, is the fact that my favorite track was removed from the game. The alpha version of the Cleric Beast track contends with all music for the title of the greatest thing I have ever heard. It was removed, and now he and Amelia share the same track, but, as I said earlier, I understand why. I do wish it had been kept around, though. I frankly won't ever understand why it was removed in the first place. They obviously went to the trouble of creating and recording it, so why the exclusion? I even went to the trouble of leaving the Cleric Beast alive one game until after I had killed Amelia, meaning that night had set in, and then again after I had killed Rom, meaning that the Chaos Guy had set in. I was hoping that fighting the Cleric be Beast during either of these would reveal the alpha version of the track, but this was not the case. We all know it's a problem, but the frame rate of Bloodborne can be horrible. And I mean atrocious. Continually throughout the game, it will dip into the noticeably slow territory. This isn't a Blighttown problem, this is an entire game problem. I had an entire fight with Amelia seem as if happening in an alternate reality, the entire thing clunky and slowed, to the point that I was never confident in what attacks I was going to perform. It was ugly, and my complaints get stronger. On dozens of occasions, perhaps even reaching 100 or more, my character would not perform an action due to the flailing flame rate, frame rate. No excuses or acceptance about it. Bloodborne is really shitty when it comes to its frame rate, far worse than all three Souls titles. It is so bad that the game can literally be unplayable. Not figuratively, literally. You press a command and nothing happens because all the frames in which you press that button were removed from the game. On top of the frame rate disease is another set of glitches that are like a plague, that of popping textures. By average, every time I play I experience this problem. It's gotten to the point that I expect to see it now. Or not see it, I guess. The game has a lot of glitches too, at least in this player's experience. I encountered more glitches in Bloodborne than any of the three Souls games. Now, I know that certain terrible things happened in the two Dark games in particular, but I did not have an issue with them making Bloodborne the worst game for glitches for me. Speaking of not being able to perform an action, there are two other cases of this as well, the first having to do with the messages that will appear on the screen. They last far too long. Way, way too long. The messages that you opened a door in a dungeon, that someone invaded, that your bell is searching and so on, remain on the screen for entirely too long. The worst one of all is the ridiculous Blood Echoes Retrieved message, which not only takes up a third of the screen, it also darkens the entire view and lasts for an eternity. The repetitious nature of the bell messages is aggravating to say the least. I understand that in their bell system that they have to have a way to let the players know that the game is still attempting to find a match. That could e have easily been a glowing icon beside our health and stamina bars. Fuck that, it's already there in the form of a glowing ripple from our position. And an icon beside our health. It's already there. To have the large message box overtake the screen over and over again is ridiculous. Even the boxes themselves are far too large. The messages don't need that much space. It's as if From thinks that we, the audience, are a bunch of morons that won't notice the words on the screen when they are already not normally there. I often find myself refusing to do anything while a message might be active. Or the reverse, won't do anything that activates a message until all the other activity is completely ceased. If there is a lever to pull in a dungeon, I will not only kill the entirety of the mobs in the room, but will wait a minute to make sure nothing else is going to wander nearby. I know that earlier I said that the levels all feel fleshed out, detailed, and complete. That's true, and I'm not taking that away from the game. However, what I am going to complain about is the lack of variety amongst the levels. With little exception, the aerials all feel practically the same. Central Yarnum, the Cathedral Ward, Old Yarnum, the Healing Church Workshop, and the Upper Cathedral Ward might as well not even have bosses separating them. It's one big area, and while that is something to be commended, it also causes boredom. Perhaps that is too strong of a slant, but I know that I, personally, 
found myself ceasing to care about looking around after my first hour in central Yarnum, up until I was in the forest. It simply became too much of the same. The same color palette, the same structures, the same design choices, and the same mobs. Dudes, werewolves, brain suckers, and birds. Ugh. I w it was finally, when reaching the forest, that I became interested in my surroundings again. There's a couple of secondary problems with the design choices as well. There is shit everywhere. EVERYWHERE! How many coffins, chairs, boxes, and gravestones can be randomly scattered about? Not nearly as many as Bloodborne presents, that's for sure. It's preposterous and worse, a detriment to the gameplay. I can't even begin to count the number of times I got stuck on something that I couldn't even see. The problem only gets worse the further you go into the game, too. You think the massive amount of tombstones and coffins are a problem? Just wait till you are in the forest or nightmare area and a tiny, insignificant rock impedes your roll. You can hardly even see the fuckers because of the camera and the debris scattered about. I want the world to feel organic and alive, and I know assuredly from Dark Souls 2 that a bunch of blank hallways leads to a worse, drab feeling, but Bloodborne overdoes it in the worst of ways. The effects of a stack of coffins would be amplified a hundredfold by having only an area or two littered with them. After seeing a thousand of them, the visual effect is utterly lost. I thought this was something that Miyazaki understood. With New Londo waiting to reveal the thousands of corpses until after the flood was removed? But I guess not. I also mentioned the camera, which works mostly well in this game. However, there are a handful of bosses that become more of a camera boss than anything else. Now, I understand that a part of fighting giant creatures should be that you feel overwhelmed. They are massive and standing over you, so you shouldn't have a better view. However, this is a video game, and as such, I'd rather be able to focus on the fight. The Cleric Beast is the best and easiest example. A giant boss in a narrow bridge, the camera showing nothing but railing or fur at times. What can I say? This is going to be a short section. One of the areas in which Bloodborne excels is its storytelling. The only real complaint is something that I brought up before, that there is too few NPCs. I thoroughly enjoyed them, but there's no denying that most have very little of interest to say, or say anything at all. On the same hand, too many NPCs could have made the game feel less threatening. It's hard to know, but the world does feel a touch empty at times in terms of hunters, when they should be out there with you the entire time. Simple little things could have helped with this. Just put an NPC hunter in the sewers at a certain point, like in the room with all the sunken guys most players encounter for the first time. The NPC could have been attacking them to let the players know that the enemies exist. Then, if they are killed without the player or the NPC dying, he sits down as if to rest. He wouldn't even need to say anything. Oh well, opportunities lost. This is where I begin to truly fume. Night. Bloodborne does so much right, only to be undermined by, by some strongly incorrect things. I barely even know where to begin, so let's just start with the combat, as this is originally what I said was good about the gameplay section. First off, there are hit detection issues. Now, not nearly as bad as what we put up with the Dark Souls 2, but definitely worse than in either Dark Souls or Demon Souls. To be fair, some of what I experienced was either patched out, or it truly was far and few between random glitches. Attacks connecting that aren't even close, my weapon going directly through an enemy without a touch, and so on. You all know what hit detection is. The other two complaints I have about the combat go hand in hand. I hate how easily you are stun-locked in this game. As much as I love Demon Souls, one of the things inarguably broken in that game is the stun-lock, and it is something they went to great lengths to repair in both dark games. Early on, when it was a problem in Dark Souls, they fixed the issue in patches by lengthening the time between attacks on certain weapons. They knew it was a broken issue, and yet it still has returned in Bloodborne, and is worse than ever. One hit continually leads to another, to the point that the majority of deaths in the game come from being comboed into oblivion, and not necessarily stupid mistakes. 
Being hit by a mob should not mean being hit by it three times, or more. This gets even worse with the bosses, and is the other issue along with stunlocking. Believe me, I know that we are fighting a bunch of beasts, and that they need to act accordingly, but come on, their attacks get oppressive. Far too many of them don't just attack, but go into a nearly uncountable string of combos that will kill any player, especially because they are going to get stunlocked. That's not even the worst of it, or rather, not my strongest complaint about the bosses. What really disappoints me can take a bit of effort to explain. You see, what I love about the Souls games is the precise, calculated fighting. Even if sped up at times, causing the player to feel as if chaos is reigning, there is also deliberate equations to the fight. The player merely has to figure out the formula and implant it upon his or her, her skill. Even the craziest bosses of the past, like Ornstein and Smoke, Four Kings, Flame Lurker, Alan, and the Fume Knight, were all mathematical and based around precise combat. Now, however, in Bloodborne, chaos truly does reign. There is something to be said about bosses being less predict predictable and more realistic, but it is also still a video game. Many of the fights are now nothing but a fury of swipes and jumps causing the bosses to feel as if without any programming, and forcing the player into a less combat-oriented strategy. What do I mean by that? Take this example, the Fume Knight, proclaimed as one of the hardest bosses in all of Dark Souls 2, if not the hardest. His attacks have a tendency to kill players in a single hit, and he practically refuses to let up. However, if you practice and learn his attacks, you can roll through the large sweep, dodge his slashes, and maneuver between his expanding AoE. You can stay close, move in, and attack with calculation and effort. That is not the case in Bloodborne. The majority of the bosses are so busy furiously swiping that moving in is a fool's choice. Instead, the best and only strategy is usually to bait attacks from a long or middle range, then moving in to score a hit before getting the fuck out of there. Once I realized this, the fights not only became much easier, they became far more boring. The player being able to dodge, parry, and attack rapidly became pointless because you were forced to get away and bait the boss again. One other part I hate about stunlocking is the fact that now you can be continually beaten up while on the ground, something you aren't allowed to do in exchange to the enemies. When they knock you down, they can pounce on your position and continue to take your life. Just dumb. And it's also dumb how non-aggressive parts of boss figures, like their hind legs, will stun you even if you've successfully dodged. This is most easily noticed with Amelia, who simply begins to rotate in order to stun the players out of an action. I've also had issues with the targeting. Of course, this isn't new to Bloodborne, it's something that has been existent in all three Souls games as well. I either won't target an enemy that is right in front of me, or when I attempt to switch targets will not, or will pass right over the enemy I was hoping to lock onto. Nothing new, but I was hoping it would be fixed for a PS4 release. I suppose my expectations are on me, though. <sighs> a couple of small complaints thrown in the middle here. I know that Bloodborne is somewhat streamlined, with removal of equip burden, item burden, options within the upgrade system, and so on, but I find myself missing those things. Souls was never a particularly heavy RPG, but those elements helped it feel as if your choices in leveling held more weight. Now the game is arguably more of an action title, and, while I still disagree with that, it's very hard to argue with those who make this claim. It's particularly noticeable with the upgrade system. One path. One fucking path. From zero to plus ten, and that's it. Not only is this boring, but it leads to another problem that I will get to shortly. That of treasure. There are gems to alter the weapons, but not only are these the most annoying part of the game, they aren't a part of the upgrade system itself. And then if you want to upgrade more than two weapons, you can kiss all your free time away. Shards and twin shards are not so bad to come by, but chunks and rocks are just awful. You can get one rock per playthrough. One, and a few in the dungeons, but let's not kid ourselves. The amount of time you have to put into the dungeons would mean it would be quicker to go through the main game over and over. The chunks are even worse, only very, rop very rarely dropping from the few enemies that can yield them. I have never bothered, because I can't bring myself to. But those that have farmed for the chunks compare the process to attempting to get the pure bladestone from Demon Souls. All of this means that experimentation is off the table. 
Once you start upgrading a weapon set, you need to stick with it or scrap the character. To be fair, there's not a monumental difference between a weapon at plus 9 and plus 10, but you are handicapping yourself when it comes to f PvP. It also means that even just from a point of interest, you can't try out as many weapons to see which you like best for your next character. You just have to pick a few and hope they are to your liking. Speaking of upgrades, another thing I was disappointed by was the lack of upgrading armor. It's great how all the sets are similar in terms of defense, meaning that you can wear whatever you want and be competitive, but it's also boring to be without upgrades. The system had begun to seem frustrating already in Dark Souls 2, so I was hoping they would alter the way in which you upgraded armor, like adding hit point regen or poison resistance. Instead, they returned to Demon Souls' utter lack of upgrades. The one weapon that truly bothers me is the Evelyn, which is precisely an upgrade to the pistol. All other weapons, all other firearms in the game are unique, having their own advantages, disadvantages, and place in the combat. The Evelyn simply replaces the pistol, as if From wanted you to waste materials upgrading the thing, only to find out there is a better version later on. It is a disappointment that Garmin is pretty much another parry boss. I know you don't have to parry him, just like you don't have to parry Gwyn, but they are both significantly easier if you do. After playing through all the game had to offer, I have to say that Queen Yarnum would have made a far better last boss. She's slightly more of a challenge, and by far a better fight. In fact, she is one of the better fights in the game, not because of difficulty, but because of her feeling like an actual fight, and not a crazed beast. Hell, let's move on to the treasure topic. There's nothing in this game. There are consumables, a few weapons to pick up now and then, and upgrade materials, but that's it. It's a constant festival of blood vials and bullets. Bloodborne is distinctly lacking in treasure, and this may upset me more than anything else. As I said earlier on, what I enjoy the most in gaming is killing monsters and getting treasure. There's plenty of monsters to kill, but almost never is there treasure. When I play a new game now, or even in New Game Plus, I simply run by everything. Knowing that the vast majority of the loot is shards, bullets, or vials means that I no longer care about exploration and collecting. As great as some of the areas are in the game, they are now boring because they are pointless to fight within and pointless to explore. You are almost always better off dashing your way through a level to the boss in order to avoid using up vials and bullets, unlocking the lamp, and then going back for the one or two things that may be in the level. Then, an almost proponent of that, they have incredibly bad item placement, like the six numbing mists you get before Amelia. Only six. When I played the game, when I first played the game, I thought that she was the third boss, and I mean, technically she is the second. She can be the fifth, but that's only if you take on optional bosses, seeking them out, out of your way, deliberately. She was tough, and I was using my numbing mists without any success of killing her. When you're low level and have no idea how to kill her, you need those mists, and yet they only give you six. Since I mentioned the optional bosses, I might as well dive into one of my biggest complaints, that being that Bloodborne has little to no intuitive exploration. No, don't even say it. Don't try and place the blame on me. You're talking to the guy who has played all three Souls games to death, and was able to almost fully explore each of them on my first playthrough. You know why? Because they left little hints or suggestions that you should come back when you have certain items. A few examples of how poorly done the exploration in Bloodborne is. First, killing of the blood-starved beast opening the way to the healing church workshop. No indication is given that a door opens or that the two are connected. You can happen to see it at some point if you walk through the temple or warp in, but even then you would have to actively check to see if the door opened for no reason. Second, the upper cathedral ward key unlocking the door at the top of the healing church workshop. I know what you are thinking, that it's obvious, but that is hindsight. You retrieve the key in Yahargul, and the description of it mentions all three of the healing church, school of Mensis, and unseen village. It doesn't even use the word workshop, only the term the Healing Church, which is an entity, not a place, mentioned throughout the game. 
The worst of all is the Forbidden Forest being accessed by Amelia's death. What the fucking fuck from Soft? Fuck you. If you go to the door early on, you are told that you need a password. Killing Amelia doesn't even automatically unlock the cutscene, but it doesn't matter. Most people are going to check out that interesting skull. Clicking on it reveals a cutscene in which a small conversation happens, but never once the mention of a password. At the end they say, fear the old blood together, but in no way does that mean you have found a password. I turned to a friend after killing Amelia, unsure of what to do next, and he had to tell me to go back to that door. I nearly rage sold the game in that instant. The worst exploration I have seen in probably any game. Ah, uh, anyway, I have more complaints. You should be not only able to rest at the lamps, to reset the enemies and restore your missing health, but you should be able to stock up on vials and bullets that way. Even with the improved loading times, it is just plain stupid that you have to warp to the dream and back. This is something they got right two games ago, so why they changed it back to the Demon Souls style is beyond me. I can only assume someone was bashing them in the heads with a Demon Souls hammer while they discussed the lamps. It would be better if you could warp between the lamps, but I am also of the opinion that Dark Souls 2 went overboard with this. Hell, I think the first Dark Souls went too far in its warping when Artorius of the Abyss came out. It should just be a few key lamps, like Central Yarnum, the Cathedral Ward, and every boss chamber once that boss is defeated. Those are just examples. I haven't bothered to fully plot this out because it's pointless for me to do so. We are finally at my last complaint for this section. I save this for last because I consider it the worst thing From has put in their games yet. And yes, I know I am sort of mentioning that phrase too often. But this is worse than the frame rate of Blighttown, worse than the pure Bladestone, worse than the nearly unplayable hit detection in Dark Souls 2, and worse than the exploration in this game, Bloodborne. I'm talking about Frenzy. What a fucking horrible status. Even with all the best gear and runes on it, procs too quickly. It does an insane amount of damage. Using sedatives, a rare and expensive item, only causes it a delay of two seconds because the meter will begin to build up again immediately. The mobs that cast it can see you from any angle and at great distances. In Mensis, there is also an overseer mob that can burn you with frenzy as long as you are in sight. Even if you get out of range by hiding behind something, the meter continues to build for no reason. The mobs that cast it can easily grab you, further inflicting frenzy. Not only does the meter fill, but you are hit by spears of damage as it is filling. It's far, far too much. Some of these effects combined make a deadly status. All of them combined makes for a terrible game. I am glad that I already have a high-level character with everything available in the game, and then also three PvP builds already made. I never plan on playing through the game again, and I mean that. Frenzy is such a bad mechanic that I am forced to consider Bloodborne as unworthy of playing. In half a year when the PV PvP starts to die down, I am very likely to sell the game off. In this game, there are three different things that can promote it being played into perpetuity. The first is, of course, the main campaign. Though experiencing the vanilla game multiple times over is not everyone's idea of fun, the Souls games are usually a perfect fit for it because of the intense levels of challenge and bosses. Bloodborne is no exception to this, but you already know what I'm going to say because I just got done ranting about it. For my tastes, unless Frenzy is patched, I consider the main campaign to be off-limits. I stocked up my PvP characters full of items and then backed up the save, so when they do run out of stuff, I can simply restore and play them fresh again. The second chance for longevity is in that PvP, and this is where I think Bloodborne has a real chance of sticking around. Despite the low number of weapons and spells, they are all useful and worthy of person-to-person -person combat. It can be quite a chore to make a new build, thanks to the low number of blood chunks and rocks, but if one struggles through that, the PvP is available. And it works quite well, too. 
at least for, as of the first half of May 2015, the connections are fast as well as the loading times. The fights are fluid and yet solid, with hardly ever a case experienced by this reviewer of a missed strike counting as a hit. Third is the Chalice Dungeons, something I have nearly avoided mentioning until now. The concept of the dungeons is amazing. It is exactly what I always wanted from a video game. A buddy of mine, who is a programmer, has discussed with me several times how such a game, with random dungeon layouts, enemies, and treasures, would be the greatest thing ever. I believe this is still true, and I believe that Bloodborne has got the process started. At least I hope so. The problem with the Chalice, chalice Dungeons... Well, there, there's many problems. Though the layouts do change, it, it is never significant enough that you feel as if you were exploring. Far more than the main game, it feels, and is, just a series of hallways and rooms. No true structure, with little difference from one chamber to the next. The best part of these dungeons should have been searching for treasure, but once again you are mainly finding vials and bullets. What you don't find of consumables is almost always materials for making new dungeons. Woohoo! And a lot of materials you're going to need, too. A lot. There are unique versions of each weapon inside the dungeons, but to even begin searching for them means trudging through numerous earlier iterations. Not just to clear them, but also to farm them over and over again for the more rare of dungeon-making materials. It's an incredible time sink that no one should ever undertake. Thank goodness for the glyph system, that of sharing dungeon codes so that people can skip making dungeons without treasure, wasting their materials. However, even when using this peer system, you are still preparing yourself for an extensive time sink. My example is of farming for one of the best physical radial gems. It took 15 tries, meaning that I got 14 useless gems over a three-night process to get the gem that I wanted. That was after I farmed 10 dungeons, a previous four-night process, for 15 two-mold fives that I needed to begin searching for a glyph shared dungeon. Now, I learned toward the end that you can simply find an enemy who drops an item that you want and farm it repeatedly, rather than clearing a dungeon, but that's still an investment. All of this is so you can competitively compete in PvP. Make no mistake about that either, you will be forced to acquire these gems if you want to fight those who also have them. The difference they make in damage is astounding, to the point that you will be chipping away at them while they knock you out in two hits. It's not... it's not that the dungeons are bad. Frankly, for a couple of weeks while I was having quite a blast getting through them, they are a great spot to find gems and face some new, more challenging bosses that aren't in the main game. It's simply that their effectiveness in prolonging the game's lifespan has been wasted. It's too much of a chore, instead of the fun in playing a video game it should have been. Overall, the longevity of Bloodborne is flailing, and I predict that it will not hang around in popularity even as long as Dark Souls 2. The dungeons are too great of a time sink for too little of rewards, as in the ratio between great treasure and time spent is wildly off. The PvP is great, but creating new characters is unsanitary with the limitation of chunks and rocks. And then the main campaign is both short, easy, and yet plagued by the worst mechanic of all time, Frenzy. This has been quite a long review, and to summarize it seems almost impossible, particularly when you are as in love with this series, or this style of games, as I am. It even hurts a little bit just to point out the flaws in the game, but it can't be helped, not if I want to be honest. The combat is amazing, there's no denying that. I simply wish it wasn't against a collection of almost entirely furious crazed beasts that the best strategy wasn't to bait attacks, move in, and then move out again. It would be nice to have more variety in the bosses and enemies, but in opposition of that, it also feels great to finally have an entirety of weapons that are useful and competitive. 
The el elimination of the top tier arsenal is perhaps the greatest improvement over the Souls games, so long as you care about PvP. There's no doubt that Bloodborne is one of the best looking games currently available, if not the best, and it is filled with the most wonderful soundtrack created thus far. The world is detailed down to the point of meaningless little rocks in the forest feeling complete and deliberate. However, it is the least intuitive in its creation when it comes to exploration and suggestions of where and when you should travel certain places. I don't prefer my hand to be held when I'm playing a game, but the three Souls titles were all far better about leaving hints and subtle clues to allow the players to continue forward. The password indeed. Blah, terrible. I can't stress enough how poorly implemented Frenzy is, and how boring and lame farming the dungeons for materials and gems immediately becomes. Getting through the nightmare zones and trudging through the dungeons is only a chore, and can basically make a player lose interest. If someone told me they were the reason they quit the game, I would not blame them in the slightest. Which isn't to say that the game is not interesting as a whole. The story and characters are fantastic, as well as the elements of the moon, beast, demon pregnancy, and church experiments. One thing I didn't mention that I feel compelled to now is that Bloodborne also has what should be considered the most frightening enemy of all creation. The brain suckers have given me nightmares and put me into a general state of paranoia. It is also a game that has such a powerful dread, atmosphere, and music that it should be a requirement for anyone who considers themselves a gamer. Everything in the game looks phenomenal, every mob, building, and boss. I also want to sneak in here that Bloodborne has the best boss with ads that I have ever seen. I'm speaking of Rom, and I know that I am in the minority, but I found his p fight perfectly executed. All in all, Bloodborne is a substantial effort by From. A great way to put a spin on a series that had begun to feel a touch dry in Dark Souls 2. It proves that From has not tired of ideas and still has a lot of room to grow, and that they are growing at an applaudable rate. Though far from perfect, Bloodborne does several things correctly that were intensely frustrating about the three Souls titles. Despite how great it plays and looks, and sounds, oh my god, that beautiful music, despite all that, it isn't truly a better game than the others. It's new and fresh, but it is still to be considered another FromSoft game that needs improvement. Once again, I recommend that any and all gamers play it. It is an experience that should not be missed. Don't go in hype for a masterpiece, and you will find something that is mostly amazing.